My name is Liz Tenterelli. I'm president of the League of Women Voters of New Hampshire. Um, tonight's event has been organized by the League of Women Voters of the Kearsarge Sunapee area, which is a nonpartisan organization whose mission includes empowering voters. So giving us the opportunity to meet the uh, candidates and ask them questions is an empowerment. And uh, that way we know who to vote for on September 13th. The primary is very important. So we thank the Kearsarge Regional School District for allowing us to use this facility. And we thank Yankee Cable Network for taping the forum. Uh, timing, the candidates drew straws to determine who is the, the starting order tonight. We will vary the order of who goes first in various questions. And generally, the candidates will have either one or two minutes for those answers. And when their time is nearly up, my colleague Nancy in the front will hold up the yellow card, indicating 30 seconds left. And when the time is up, she will hold up the red card, indicating you should finish your sentence and then stop. Thank you. <laughs> uh, when you came in, you were uh, handed a flyer about the Executive Council what it does, about its structure. So I'm not going to repeat any of that. District 2, as newly defined by last spring's redistricting legislation, covers parts of five counties. It extends from Littleton in the north along the western border of New Hampshire to Winchester on the Massachusetts border, and it extends irregularly east as far as Concord. That represents one-fifth of the state's population. Yes, I'm hearing like, doesn't that sound gerrymandered? Let's not get started on that. <laughs> it is a very irregularly shaped district. Uh, so I'm going to ask the audience to refrain from any applause to allow the most time for the candidates to answer your questions. And the candidates will now introduce themselves, tell you a little bit about why they're running and what they hope to accomplish if elected, and then we'll go on to the Q&A, and I have a pile of questions to get started. So up first is um, Cindy Warmington, please. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you tonight. Uh, I'm Cindy Warmington, and I am the executive counselor for District 2, and I am running for re-election in this newly configured District 2. For the past two years, I have been the lone Democrat on the Executive Council. We've had many 4-1 votes. We've had places where I have really worked to lift up the issues so that voters really know what's going on. For instance, when the council rejected $27 million in vaccine funding, I worked very, very hard to make sure voters understood that. All of the counselors heard the feedback from voters, and ultimately, I got them to reverse their decision, and we got that $27 million. I have been endorsed by the entire congressional delegation, including Jean Shaheen, Maggie Hassan, Chris Pappas, and Congresswoman Custer. And if reelected to the council, I work, will work very, very hard to continue to lift up our values and to be a voice of reason on the executive council. I think it is particularly important right now when women's rights are under assault that we have women's voices at the executive council table. I have been an advocate for Planned Parenthood funding. I have been relentless in my calls for the governor to bring back those contracts to the executive council. They have been voted down by the Republican executive councilors four times, but this time, the voters know about it, and they know about it because we are relentless in getting the word out to voters about what really happens at the executive council table. I ask for your vote in the Democratic primary on September 13th, and if, if elected and pass the primary, then for your vote on November 8th. Thank you. Thank you, and Mr. Michael Cryens. Hi, my name is Mike Cryens, and uh, First of all, thank you for the League for hosting this. What a wonderful crowd. Uh, I was an executive counselor for District 1, and I'm probably the only one in the history of running for an executive council that says, boy, it's nice to have a smaller district. The district I represented before was 108 towns and four cities. Now it's only 77 towns and four cities. 
each representing one-fifth the population. Um, I was fortunate. When I was on the Executive Council with Andy Valinsky and Deb Pignatelli, we had the majority. So when we voted as a group, we won. Uh, we voted for Planned Parenthood. We won. It was four to one. Actually, we had one of the Republicans that joined us in that vote. So um, Ray Burton used to famously say, when someone asked him, what do you teach a new governor? He said, I always teach a new governor to count to three, because if he doesn't get three votes, he doesn't get what he wants done. And I've always remembered that and worked hard when I was on the council to make sure that what I wanted passed, we got the majority. Uh, it was a great life experience. I was a 19 year county commissioner in Grafton County, the county north of here. And also, uh, I, in addition to that, I was a banker, I was a school teacher, and I ran a nonprofit that dealt with substance misuse and suicide uh, prevention. The reason I mention those three jobs, I think they are s perfectly suited for the executive council. We do a lot of contracts, so being a banker, you're well aware of, of uh, scrutinizing uh, your documents and contracts. And in addition to that, I think we all realize public school funding is under attack constantly. People want to divert money away from the public schools into uh, religious schools and uh, homeschooling and stuff like that. I have no issue with people choosing to attend those, but I don't think public funds should be used for it. And finally, I think we all know that the uh, fentanyl problem has created a major crisis in the world of substance misuse. So thank you, and again, like everyone, I would appreciate your vote. Thank you, and Senator Harold French. Thank you. Uh, my name is Harold French. A, uh, I'm a father, a grandfather. I'm an auctioneer, a real estate broker. I run an apple orchard in Hopkinton. And in my spare time, I'm the senator for District 7, where I have served for the past six years. I sit on the Judiciary Committee, and I'm chair of Commerce. I've decided to um, give up my seat in the Senate and pursue a different branch in government and go run for the Executive Council seat. But I intend to bring my voice and my philosophy that I carried in the Senate over to that side and do the same right there. So I'd appreciate your vote. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Ms. Joanne Martin. Good evening. My name is Joanne Martin. I am an independent candidate for this office. I have lived in New Hampshire for 47 years. In the last 42 years, I have been in technology, science, and law. I have served on boards, have experience in education, the arts, business, and other matters, including how to live in hard times in New Hampshire. Make no doubt, A, I do not favor increasing the spending in New Hampshire unnecessarily, and B, there is a tidal wave of technology coming. Many people are overwhelmed with technology that has become too complex to understand and to use or to, to even control. Uh, much data is being collected on each one of us and being combined in computers by technology, which includes things like artificial intelligence that affects us. We as individuals do have no right to inquire how the artificial intelligence uses that or even protest that. So at tomorrow's executive council, there are, are at least 23 items which can possibly touch on artificial intelligence and data security. And the total budget of that is $25 million. One particular example of that is the management of New Hampshire Medicare. Uh, there, the, the council is considering a half million dollar uh, plan uh, hire to have them review how New Hampshire is managing their thing, their, 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 their Medicare. And that has to be done by artificial intelligence. I will work for you to protect you from artificial intelligence when it, when it hurts you, and I will work to make technology work for you. I am not afraid of technology, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, and Kim Strathdee. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here and meet everybody for the first time. 
Um, I do, I am from Lincoln, and so I have actually been on your ballot for the last two years if you live in New London, because that was part of the original District 1 where I live. Um, I, in terms of what I do, I am actually a cook from childhood, and I cook in a diner right now. I dabble in antiquities as Harold does. I have a bachelor's degree in accounting, which would be key in working in the executive council office. In terms of my home, I have turned it from lawn and overgrown with trees into a sustainable garden and working a little bit toward farming. Uh, that's a little bit about myself. Um, I am a lifelong resident of New Hampshire, well, since six months, <laughs> and um, grew up uh, way up north in the Canadian border in West Stewartstown. Um, I have traveled around a bit, and as with Harold, I, in my spare time, I hope to be your advocate. If you have the papers that we do, you can see what the executive council does. Um, most of it is, it doesn't indicate on here, but it's all by RSA. These are all our state laws that we do our job by, our job description. What it doesn't tell you on here is what I think is one of the most important roles for us because as some of the others have pointed out, this is a population-based constituency. And so the governor, the way I put it, is not able to answer every citizen in the state on any given day whatsoever. However, when you make a call to your executive counselor, you can expect me to answer within 24 hours, or I'm sure any of the other candidates sitting with me as well. And we all take that role very seriously in this position. Thank you very much for my invite, and it was a pleasure to be in New London. All right, we're going to start with the questions now, and I'm going to start with one of the less complicated ones, I hope. Uh, and we're going to try for one minute for this question. Uh, one of the executive council responsibilities is to review and then approve state contracts over $10,000. Do you believe that all contracts must go out to competitive bidding? And do you believe the lowest bidder for any particular service or product should be the one to get the contract, or would you consider other things? And let's start with Mr. French on this one. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I do believe that contracts should go out to competitive bid. And I'm not so sure, though. I believe that the low bid should be the winning bid. There's more to uh, um, a contract than just price. So that would cover it. Thank you. Ms. Martin? Yes, I agree. Oh, thank you. I agree that contracts should go out to competitive bid when possible. There are times that things are expedient, that we need to move quickly. If there are emergencies, then we need to know who our vendors are. And I think the good thing about New Hampshire is that we know who the players are. As far as the low bid is concerned, often that is good, is good but again, we have to have some uh, relationship with our vendors so we, we get to know who they are. So if, if we are going blind, that's a problem, but in this state, we know who our, our vendors are. Thank you. Ms. Strathty? The simple answer is yes and no. Yes, we should uh, be approving all contracts. No, not necessarily the lowest bid. You have to, again, weigh a lot of things before you make that final decision. And Ms. Warmington? In general, I believe that contracts should go out to bid, and I often raise that issue at executive council meetings. The, um, recently, we just made a change to make sure that all contracts that are sole source contracts are identified in the agenda so that everyone will know about that. Um, it, it is, there are times when it's not appropriate for contracts to go out to bid. For instance, if it's a federal contract and there are only certain contractors that can provide the service, if it's, if it's just your, say, your community mental health centers and they're going to go to those or your cap agencies, then those contracts will go to the, to the, the local or by statute, they will go to the, um, the, the vendor of choice. But in general, I, I do push and insist that um, the contracts go out to bid. 
As far as uh, the low bid, um, in most cases when it is a commodity item, for instance, if it's most often in transportation like paving or painting lines on roads or something that's a commodity and you have a series of qualified bidders, then it should go to the low bidder. But if there are more other subjective things that need to be taken into consideration, such as uh, engineering contracts or quality, then those are also factors that need to be weighed. Thank you, and Mr. Cryens. So I am not against sole source. At times, um, when I was a county commissioner, and actually overflowed into being a counselor, there are times when, I'll give you a good example, when we ran the nursing homes, um, the nursing home administrator would say it's easier for us to buy 50 beds from the people we've been buying 50 beds each time than to go out for a bid and start getting different parts because they would sort of steal parts away from each other to make them work over a period of time. So I think sometimes sole source is the important way to go. Uh, obviously, bidding is very important, but it's not the only thing. And the final thing would be as far as um, uh, low bid, uh, we saw a good example where the low bid in one of our contracts uh, was for an Indiana company and a number of the state, uh, I believe it was nursing groups, came to us and said, you know, we really could use that contract because we can do it better than them to outsource it to another state. And uh, that rationale prevailed and we en ended up going with an out-of-state out source. I'm not against the out-of-state source and doing it in-state. I got the red card. All right, thank you. Uh, and you know, I'm, now I'm going to get to the hard question, okay? And you knew this was coming. We've got several questions here that I'm combining. Perhaps the most publicized action of the Executive Council in the past two years has been the vote not to fund the three women's health clinics in New Hampshire that also perform abortions, even though abortion expenses are kept separate from the health care budget and are not funded by state money. A recent article in the New Hampshire Bulletin reports that 18,000 low-income or uninsured women rely on these and several other clinics for their health care needs. It's likely that the Executive Council will be faced with a similar funding decision. How will you vote and why? And we're going to start with Ms. Strathdee on this. I will vote in favor of the woman to make her own choice. It's um, one of these things that I don't believe it's for me to go there and vote what Kim Strathy would vote. It's what it's it's what's correct and right for the women. There are so many young women. Um, when I was in my early late teens, early twenties, if it weren't for um, family uh, planning. I wouldn't have had a resource to get my, um, or insurance or anything to get my annual exams, which are so important. I think we do a terrible disservice if we do not help these girls. Thank you. Ms. Warmington, and there was an additional question addressed specifically to you on this topic, so I will read that now. Uh, when an item is one of the exec is on the executive council agenda, the governor normally does not bring it forward unless he or she has at least three votes. Why cannot the governor convince at least two other counselors to work for Planned Parenthood? So you can either address my primary question or that one. Well, I think everyone here probably knows I will vote to support Planned Parenthood, Equality Health Center, Joan G. Lovering. All of the family planning providers in our state, they are providing essential services uh, just to, not to confuse, to make sure that people don't confuse the issue. What the council defunded was the provision of cancer screenings, pap smears, breast exams, of contraception, and of sexually transmitted disease testing and treatment at a time when we're having a spike of those diseases in our state. These, they have denied health care, the most essential health care for the women across our state and resulted in the closing of the um, Claremont Family Planning Clinic, leaving the North Country with essentially no family planning services. Uh, it, is, um, it is really a disgraceful act 
that they brought their own ideology to the council, uh, their anti-abortion ideology, and used that as an excuse to defund these essential health care services. As for the second question, I cannot answer for the governor. I have no idea what he is thinking or why he has not worked to gain a majority on the executive council to fund family planning services. And Mr. Cryens. Well, I have voted for, uh, by four to one, I think I mentioned in my uh, opening remarks when I was on the council, we voted four to one for the planning um, money to go to the three services that were mentioned that have been excluded. Um, I think it's deplorable that the um, executive council has done what it has done, but I understand knowing many of them, of that four group, that um, I don't know if the governor even could persuade them. Um, I'm not taking his side, but I, I don't know if they want to be persuaded. They've stuck their heels in, and that's why we need to get a majority back on the executive council. As a Democrat speaking, we have to get majority back. Um, so I, my vote stands. I voted for it, and I'm proud of that vote. Senator French. Thank you. Having served in the Senate, I've learned not to say how I would vote on something, but let me tell you this. The um, New Hampshire Republican Senate voted to protect women's rights to abortion up to 24 weeks. And when we did that, we did that without a single Democrat vote. After we did it, Planned Parenthood spent tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars of money that could have been used for women's health care to vilify the Republicans for protecting women's rights to abortion up to 24 weeks. So that leads me to believe that Planned Parenthood is for unlimited abortions time for women, up to and including partial birth abortion. And if that is the case, there is no way ever I would send money to Planned Parenthood because I am absolutely against partial birth abortion. Thank you. Ms. Martin. Thank you for that question. The question is simplification of reality, and I have to be careful here because it's hypothetical. If these services are segregated from the abortion services, I can see no justification not to support it. And as far as things that border on the abortion services, I will abide by the current New Hampshire law. Beyond that, if I ever get elected to legislature, I may I speak to that. But right now, as executive counsel, that's what I would do. Thank you. And I, I have a related question. Um, since many of the executive council decisions involve health care um, funding, what is your personal training or expertise in health issues, uh, especially women's health and mental health? And if, if that's a real quick question, I guess. So let's just go down the row with that. Mr. Cryens? Well, my training is uh, for 13 years or actually 11 years, I ran Headrest, which is a, an agency that deals with substance misuse and uh, suicide. While you might not think that is a lead to healthcare, it is amazing the number of women that pass through Headrest that their sole source of uh, basic healthcare was Planned Parenthood. Um, I'm very concerned about people dealing with substance misuse. And as far as my time on the council, we voted for a number of contracts that dealt with that issue. Uh, I am not a healthcare expert, uh, but I am, um, I guess, probably after 10 years, somewhat knowledgeable of some of the scourge of substance misuse. And as far as mental health, um, I was one of the people that started the mental health court at Grafton County as a county commissioner and also a drug court, which both of them uh, dealt with issues that were uh, paramount in our uh, jail system and helped keep people out of the jail. 
and I'm very proud of the product that we created with both the mental health and the drug court. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. French? Uh, my expertise would be uh, serving in the legislature for the past eight years. I have gained an expertise on listening to those who come and testify before us and who are experts in fields and weighing out whether they're telling me the truth or not. Thank you. Ms. Uh, Ms. Martin? I have no specific expertise with women's health service other than to be a supportive friend. I've had several who were in uh, crisis pregnancy and they wanted to keep it. I had one in particular that I, the, the child would have been my godchild and I supported that abortion because of a chromosomal defect. And I had others who, for a variety of reasons, took different paths and I was with them. Ms. Strathdee. My experience is all um, firsthand, uh, not, not educationally based. I have, uh, I lost a nephew to suicide in addition to many other friends, so I am very keen to be alert to depression and to be there for people who may you know, just need a shoulder to cry on or somebody to talk to. I'm very in tune with uh, veterans issues. So uh, again, veterans crisis and suicide prevention, I've been very involved with that. I've uh, gone through um, stages of Alzheimer's and dementia with quite a few people in my, in my family as well. Um, in terms of young children, I watch for bullying and the start of, of mental health issues. Um, and I just try to be there and sensitive to my surroundings. Ms. Warmington? Prior to being elected to the Executive Council, I have 40 years of experience in healthcare. My undergraduate degree is in medical technology, and my first job was as a laboratory technologist at Lakes Region General Hospital. I went on to become the blood bank supervisor, a hospital laboratory manager, a hospital business office manager. I worked in various administrative capacities in hospitals. I basically say I was born in a hospital and never left. Uh, 20, after 20 years, uh, I chose to go to law school and became a healthcare attorney. And for 20 years, I uh, was a healthcare attorney and I chaired the health law section at Shaheen and Gordon. In that capacity, I advocated for uh, the expansion of telehealth, for the expansion of Medicaid services, and other healthcare services. In my spare time, my volunteer time, I volunteered uh, for the local mental health center. I chaired the Lakes Region Mental Health Center. And when I moved to Concord, I joined the board of Riverbend. I have an extensive amount of work in the area of substance use disorder as well, serving on a board of a local uh, substance use provider and also on the professional, um, uh, the New Hampshire Professionals Health Program Board. Um, healthcare is the reason I got involved in politics. Uh, more than 25 years ago, I started advocating for universal health care. Uh, when I came to the council, um, I was, and I am now, the only person on the council uh, with experience in health care. And as um, the moderator has pointed out, and a huge portion of our budget is health care. And one of the things that I did was start getting involved in the contracts at an earlier process so that we could really make a difference in those contracts even before they come to the council. Thank you. All right, thank you. We're going to change gears here. I have two questions that relate to the fact that you have oversight, uh, you, sorry, the executive council has oversight over the highway plan and transportation. So you can choose how you want to answer these two questions. Your position on public transportation in New Hampshire, specifically a possible train from Boston to Concord, or a bus from Concord along I-89 up to this area. Oh my, a bus up here, wow. 
Uh, and then the, the, other, the other related question is, what criteria would you use to accept or reject highway transportation projects? And we're going to start with Ms. Martin. Thank you again for this question. I think this, the, this question is, is very good because it's dealing with public transportation, but it's, a, it's according to the traditional plans of buses and trains. Right now we have things called electric vehicles, Teslas, and the artificial intelligence is, is, is giving the insurance companies a major headache because you're not hearing about all the strange things that are happening. And that is going to be a big problem for our transportation society, uh, infrastructure. What will happen is the insurance companies will push the li this, this problem of liability. In artificial intelligence, you have black box computations, and nobody really knows what's going on inside there. There's, there's undefined liabilities. When you have a human being inside of an electric vehicle, they call that person a liability sponge. There's, a, there's major things happening for transportation Trains are good, and it may ultimately be the best thing because there won't there be relatively low liability. But the problems with, with the technology, which is, which is already here, is it's putting us in jeopardy, and we are not being told about. I'm the only one with the technology background to, to know anything about this. So the real question we have is when they start pushing off on the state of New Hampshire liability, and they want to start having things like smart highways with embedded signs and things like that to guide the vehicles to reduce the accidents so that the insurance companies and the banks can reduce their load. Those are the things that New Hampshire, we are, we are up, just up the road from, from Boston and the technology down there. And this is the things that, that the technology, uh, that, that, the, that the executive council will have to and must deal with. Thank you. Ms. Strathdee, public transportation or the state highway plan, accepting or rejecting projects? I've got, <laughs> I've got thoughts on both of them. Uh, one thing I like to say about uh, transportation in New Hampshire is you can go anywhere you want as long as it's north and south. <laughs> East and west, <laughs> forget it. Uh, trains and rails, you might as well forget that as well. That is, is long in the past. We cannot recover from all of the land that is all of the rails that have been um, torn up. Now, I got to tell you, on this one, I am I, I can't help but look north to Coas and over to Carroll as well, um, which would have been my district had things not, well, changed, shall we say. Um, Colbrook, we used to be able to catch a bus in Colbrook. Now anybody up in Coas? You got to come to Littleton before you can even get on a bus. Hello. Um, and then in terms of the infrastructure and, and the highway plan, let's talk about the new district too. If anything happens, we have the largest stretch of the Connecticut River between us and Vermont. If anything happens to one of those bridges, we do not only affect the economy in New Hampshire, we also affect it in Vermont. People who once were able to go just across a bridge, if one bridge gets washed out, let's just use 10 miles average between bridges if you go north and south along the Connecticut, 10, 20, 30, 40 miles a day times five days a week, all of a sudden somebody's got to drive an extra 200 miles to get to work price of gas, that's not too good. So uh, short answer is the highway, um, the 10 year highway plan is extremely important. We pay attention to it. Thank you. Ms. Warmington. Thank you. I, in, I support public transportation and have been a supporter through that, through the, um, through the highway planning project. Um, for those of you that don't know, the council is responsible for the 10-year highway plan. It meets on the odd-numbered years, and we, we conduct hearings all around the state to listen to what constituents' concerns are about transportation. 
What people, many people don't know is that that process is actually going on all the time. And it's the regional planning commissions where those projects really come through and are brought to the council. So it's very important to me to stay in touch with my regional planning commissions and to listen to the communities and the people in the community about what is important to them. I certainly heard a great deal about the bridges on the Connecticut River when I was uh, on the on the when we were doing the 10-year highway transportation plan. Um, in fact, for the first time ever, we got the Vilas Bridge funded um, at full funding, so that it's actually in the plan and going to be um, funded. Uh, I am again a supporter of public transportation, and in all it, its capacities, I see it as not only. Um, a way to, that every, allows everyone to connect. It is a way to address environmental issues and it is an economic justice issue. When you have housing costing as much as it does and people having to live so far away from where they work and a lot of times not able to work in the big cities, allowing public, having public transportation gives people the ability to still uh, um, purchase a home, even if they have to travel, but they can purchase a home and, and um, have public transportation to their work, not have to pay for a parking space in the city, which is very expensive. So public transportation is more than um, just, uh, it's not a simple issue. It's a complicated issue that will make New Hampshire more attractive for people to live in. And that is one of the criteria that I use when evaluating projects. Thank you. Mr. Pryance. So first of all, when I went on the council, and the 10-year highway plan, it is eye-opening because I think some of the projects that have been on the 10-year highway plan have been on there for 20, 25, 30 years. They don't seem to go anywhere. Um, as far as public transportation, um, all you have to do is go to a Red Sox game from the Upper Valley and get on the bus and drive down and stop here at the little uh, uh, park and ride and see the number of cars that are sitting there uh, either using the buses or carpooling, uh, I think we all realize as, as much as we can do to keep cars off the road as, as much as possible is beneficial to all of us. Um, to go back to the 10-year highway plan, it is striking the uh, poor quality and the disrepair that many of our bridges are in. Um, I had the good fortune one time of going on a little boat under one of the bridges, and I used to just run over that bridge and I was even concerned after seeing that quality underneath that bridge, was it safe? Uh, we have a lot of bridges that are what they call red listed, and we've got to move them up as much as possible. I think we all realize uh, with the excess of money that's been coming back into the state that we have to get more stuff done this year because uh, if you talk to somebody at transportation, we, they don't know how long that is going to last. So I think that. The more roads we can get repaired, fixed, the bridges, all of that, we're going to be better off this year because at some point the federal monies will stop. And Senator French. Thank you. Um, I have a good friend in Laconia, a Democrat, Representative Charlie St. Clair. I don't know if any of you know him, but he was a, and still is a great supporter of rail. And he, in the past, was trying to get me to support rail to New Hampshire. So he tried so hard that he said, look, I'll take you to Boston. So we went to Dover, got on the train, went to Boston. He paid. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful experience. We get down to Boston. Um, he said, how do you like it? I said, love it. It's great. I said, I'm kind of hungry. So he said, let me buy you lunch. So we went. We had lunch. He paid again. Then he said, what would you like to do while we're in Boston? I said, I'd like to go to the uh, Museum of Fine Arts. So we went to the Museum of Fine Arts, had a great day, came back, got on the train, came back up. He says, how'd you like it? I said, I loved it. He says, so you support rail? I said, no, and I still don't. <laughs> Thank you, Senator French. All right. Uh, account, one of the count city, uh, exec, sorry. One of the executive council's responsibilities is approving judicial nominations and uh, commissioner appointments made by the governor. And you know, recent events have shown us that, that we're acutely aware of the importance of judicial appointments 
And of course, uh, commission appointments, department heads are important. How would you ensure the candidates are qualified and would their political stances be a factor in whether you would support or veto their appointment? And what criteria would you use in judging an appointment? So we're going to start with Ms. Warmington on this. Thank you. Um, and my criteria for appointments is pretty simple. I'm the, I'm the lone Democrat on the Executive Council. I don't expect our Republican governor to appoint Democrats. I understand that he's likely to appoint conservative nominees for many positions. I do not reject people because they are Democrats or Republicans. I review them for really two criteria. Are they qualified and are they committed to the mission of the agency or the position that they are appointed to or nominated to serve in? So for judges, that means I review extensively the documents that they provide to us. I also make phone calls. Uh, I'm, I am an attorney and I know a lot of people in the legal profession, so often make phone calls to talk to people about uh, the judges, and how, whether they would have the temperament um, to be a good judge. I also um, interview the candidates. Um, I, I actually interview the candidates for almost every single board, every single nomination that comes before the council. So I review everything um, and, and interview them and, um, and ask other people about them and then make, make my decisions based on that. Now, when I say that I, uh, political um, persuasion doesn't matter, I will say something really very clearly. We have a commissioner of education right now in Frank Edelblut who does not believe in public education. He seeks every day to undermine public education. From my perspective, that is not someone who believes in the mission of the agency, and I vote against that nomination. With, um, with um, judges, Gordon McDonald is a lifelong anti-abortion activist. As attorney general, he demonstrated his inability to separate his politics from his position as attorney general and I did not find him to be a qualified candidate to serve as the Supreme Court, the chief of our Supreme Court. That's how my decisions are made. Ms. Strathdee, we're going the other way, sir. Thank you. I'll catch on to that in a minute. Well, I, 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 <laughs> me I messed it up. I mean, I no, just wanted to keep right. you on your toes. Here. <laughs> um, first of all, I would agree that it, it's, it's based upon, um, I'd like to see your resume. Um, your expertise in the field. I agree in um, doing a, a candidacy interview. Um, I think it, it, the decision should be nonpartisan. It's uh, your, you should be there for the people of the state of New Hampshire. Um, and I think we do have a problem with some of these. I think it's fine, we've got judges, but I think if you look very often, I think we have commissioners and different positions that go empty because we cannot even attract people to take these positions for whatever reason. Sometimes taking these positions can be thankless jobs. So I, I think it um, should be our mission to get them all filled as well. Thank you. Ms. Martin. On some issues, I, am, I would appear to be liberal. Others, I would appear to be conservative. My concern is, is the person competent in doing the position? And do they have the, uh, sta the, the uh, character to carry off that mission? For instance, I have experienced personally leaders who are, look very good on paper and will look good to their superiors, but are absolutely terrible to work for and degrade the institution that they're in charge of. So beyond what they look like in paper, I would look to find out if they have the stature and character to be a leader, not just to, for themselves, but to bring that enterprise to the level that it can be. As far as judicial nominations, I agree that there, that that person would likely have a paper trail that can be reviewed. 
and we'll have to see what happens. There are people who change their personality when they achieve a higher level of authority. That's always a danger. There should be some recourse that uh, perhaps we could uh, review uh, at a certain period of time if a particular appointee uh, has faithfully or properly served their, uh, their uh, position, but that's not on the table today. So I, I believe that uh, we can look carefully. I, in this issue and in this, uh, other issues, I think there, are, there is a common level of agreement among the candidates here as to how to approach appointments and review. Thank you. Thank you. Senator French? Thank you. I find it interesting both Frank Edelblu and, and uh, Gordon McDonald were brought up as examples, and it will show you how our philosophies do differ slightly. They happen to be uh, two people I admire. I admire their abilities. I admire what they, uh, Frank has been able to do with the, uh, as uh, Commissioner of Education. He has brought great light to charter schools and which are hugely successful in New Hampshire for a lot of children, our grandchildren, our children that did not fit into public schools and were failing and he promoted that as he does all other public schools. And Gordon McDonald, if you look at his history, he is a very smart and thoughtful man. So I think we would look at our appointments uh, quite different. Mr. Cryens. Well, I guess I'm going to get Senator French going on this because I'm going to bring up Gordon McDonald. Um, I had the uh, good fortune of sitting on the Executive Council when Governor Sununu brought up Gordon McDonald. Um, and I'll give you the whole process. So Gordon McDonald would come and meet with me and the other counselors. Then we'd have a public hearing, and the public hearing was filled with people, and we get a chance to have people speak on his behalf and against him. And we also, during our interview, get a sense of where he stands on certain issues. What amazed me in the whole process is that Governor Sununu had nominated for the third time a person with no trial experience for the highest court in our system. And so after it was all done, um, I thought it was reasonable for me to pick up the phone. And I called the governor's office and uh, told our liaison that uh, I would not be voting for Gordon McDonald. Well, I probably no more than hung up the phone and my phone rang. And it was Governor Sununu. And to say he was mildly, mildly unhappy with me would be putting it uh, I guess appropriately within the confines of this room, how it should be phrased, but he wasn't happy. And I just did not think he was the right person for the job. And we voted against him. And, um, and now he's the Supreme Court Chief Justice because Governor Sununu held that seat vacant for way too long and would not nominate someone else. And I'd even given him a suggestion for somebody I thought would be a good idea, but he didn't think it would be. And so, I mean, there is a process we go through. But I think the important thing to point out through this whole process, no matter what appointment it is, the governor proposes, and then we make a decision. And you have to get three votes. And if you don't get the three votes, it doesn't happen. And it should be pointed out that most governors do a trial balloon with the council before on some of the most controversial ones. And Chris Sununu has never done that with me. He's getting mad at me also, by the way. He's, <laughs> do, do you want to say that out loud, Mr. French? <laughs> um, and and this, this is a good time, I think, for me to ask this question. Because in vetting these, these candidates for the judicial and commission things, do you ever get um, public constituent input? So I'll read the question as it was written. Executive Council meetings are recorded, and I, be I believe they are now going to be live streamed, but neither allows for public input. That may be an error, I'm not sure. If elected, how will you represent your constituents in District 2 
and how will you encourage your constituents to communicate with you about the issues that are coming up before the council? And um, Senator French, you're going to take this first. Thank you. Serving in the Senate, when real important issues come up, I'll receive maybe 500 emails from my constituents on a certain subject. So what I recommend is if you're going to send me an email, don't send me a bulk email because when you get when I get bulk emails, I don't read them because you all you've done is pay, uh, cut and paste and sent it to me. But all the emails I do read and I do read them all, the ones that aren't bulk and I listen to what the people are saying and and uh, weigh it out and and try to vote accordingly. Uh, I have I have told people in the past that serving in the Senate, the first thing you learn is every day when you wake up, there's at least 25,000 people mad at you. And the next day when you wake up, it's a different 25,000. So you're never going to please everybody. I, I think you may be right. Uh, Mr. Cryans, how would you communicate with your constituents to get public input? Well. I've always found that when people are interested, they call you. Um, I've, you'll see at the end of the table, keeping with the guidelines of the uh, League of Women Voters, I put my, my stuff there, so if you'd like to pick it up. My phone number's on it. My phone number, my email. Um, I love to be contacted. I think people that reach out to you deserve to be listened to. Uh, sometimes I w will have a long conversation. Sometimes somebody would just say, I'm against this or for this. But the amazing thing is, I think most of the calls you get are from people that need something. Um, unlike the Senate, they might get 500 calls. I've never had that happen on one specific issue. But what you do find is that, especially, and I brought this up numerous times uh, in speaking events, is during COVID, we went from 4,000 unemployed to 118,000 unemployed. And it was the people that needed help. They would call you and say, I have no money. I have no check coming in. And it's been, I'm, you know, you can almost feel like they're being strangled. And you have to take each one of those seriously and help them get money to help them make it through. Um, I think the, um, the most important thing it, an executive counselor can do is constituent service. And um, I was at an event recently, it was actually a farmer's market, and a lady came up and she said, I want to thank you for when our house was being flooded because the state highway was washing down, probably a night like tonight, into our garage and had washed out the garage and heading towards the house. You got DOT up there to help. Are you a Democrat or Republican? And I thought it was the nicest thing versus saying, you didn't, I didn't ask her whether she was a Democrat or Republican. She didn't know if I was a Democrat or Republican. So she said, were you a Democrat or Republican? And I think that is the essence of public service. Once you're there, you help the people that need help. Ms. Warmington, how would you communicate with constituents? Would you value their input, et cetera? This is really, <clears throat> this is really one of the hallmarks, I think, of my two years of service is really trying to educate the public about the Executive Council and how important the decisions there are made and how they affect you individually at your kitchen tables. So I started out doing um, videos after every council meeting, and I still do those, and emails after every council meeting to make sure constituents know what's happening. I also do individual reach outs and have also really focused on developing relationships with the media so that they report on what happens at the executive council table. Historically, the media didn't pay much attention to the executive council except on very specific uh, high profile issues and now they begin to understand the importance of those issues because we talk to them before every single meeting. 
recently, as you addressed, that the council meetings are available um, by audio. Um, in the past, that has only been after the fact, but I introduced a change to the manual of operation, um, uh, manual of operating procedures, and that was approved by the governor and council at the last meeting, so that starting tomorrow, our meetings will be broadcast uh, live audio, so that we can more people can know about them. I think it's incredibly important that we have transparency. Um, with respect to nominations, the nominations are actually made at one meeting. The governor makes his nominations and announces them publicly at one meeting, and then at the next meeting that we, we vote on them. So that's two weeks between meetings, and that's an opportunity for the public to have input. There is no public participation during an executive council meeting, um, but there is um, an opportunity for the public to be heard. Um, just in this week's agenda, though, we found an item that should have been handled as a nomination was put on the agenda as, a, um, as an, a, an agenda item. And I contacted the governor's office and said, this is a nomination. You really need to put this out so that the public can have that input. And that's what they're going to do. All right. Thank you. Ms. Strathdee? <clears throat> Um, I would say that uh, what I would do uh, is, number one, share upcoming agendas so you know what's going to be discussed at the upcoming meetings. After the meetings, um, you know, after you, and then look for the input to come in. Again, you're not going to please everybody, but it's good to hear from people and weigh all sides. Once the decisions have been made and after meetings, I uh, believe in putting out reports. I'm more of a fan of a narrative style versus a fill in the blank. But And however, um, the focus of this report would be how it affects our, our district, the new district too. Um, Another way, I, I do believe also, as Ms. Warmington just said, that um, people do not even know what the Executive Council is and represents and how lucky we are to have this in this live free or die state. Going to that, I would again, uh, I've mentioned the young kids and this is how I first learned about this position was in 1972 when I was taken from, I believe we were in the eighth grade and went to a town hall meeting. I would personally, one of the things I would like to do is to have a class presentation and go around to the different schools and classrooms, maybe have something um, on videotape and teach them from the young ages what this is and about state government in New Hampshire. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Martin? The definition of executive council provided by the state uh, uh, posting includes executive councils being the constituents' eyes and ears in Concord and to be advocates for the, for the people. Now, it's one thing to, be, uh, uh, to take in information about what is on the agenda for the council, but I want to take it farther than that. I thought about this ahead of time. I want to be able to go into communities and, some, and ride some sort of regular circuit to find out what is really happening that is outside what the, what the council does. Because it, it, it might, sh there might be some very minor modification to the a council agenda item that could solve or address more than one person's particular need. In addition, I, one, of the, one of the greatest detriments to productivity is people are afraid to show what they are and who they are, especially in today's culture, which is so negative. And what I, have, I have taught in the inner city of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and I have taught graduate courses at the law school. And I have watched people at all levels, of all economic levels, turn around when they find that somebody pays attention to them. Now, I have a diverse background, and I can hear when, pe when people are saying, and I can, I can learn when they're not, when they're quiet. So my thought is that I think this is a very, very interesting setup here. We're very unique in, in, in what we do at, for this state. I think we can do a lot more. And I have, a, I can barely sit down on this because I know, I want to hear what you say. I want to hear what the young people say. I mean, I don't want to talk to just you. I want to talk to everyone. Otherwise, I'm okay. Thank you. So that, your comments bring up a question that was handed to me 
Um, the Executive Council is an antique entity dating back to the 1600s. I'm not sure it's that far, but early 17 anyway, that only exists in New Hampshire. So is it really necessary or useful? What harm would be done by amending the New Hampshire Constitution and abolishing the council? Wouldn't that save money and I'm sorry, I can't read the, the last part of it. Wouldn't that save money? So real quick answer, OK? Like 45 seconds, Nancy. You're timing them on. And, and we're, uh, Mr. Cryens, you've served on it. Should we abolish it? <laughs> well, I'm not in favor of abolishing it. And um, I think probably the best person would ask would be Chris Sununu, because he was on it. And he's been on both sides. But uh, no, I think it serves a purpose. I think to save money and save time, I would love to see the amount raised. I think it's crazy to, at $10,000, I think it should be more like 100000 uh, to really get uh, the council moving along on some more important issues. But I think 10000 is way too low because you look at the people who are getting $10,000, usually there are small agencies and all the work that goes into writing up and submitting because there's a whole thing that goes on before it gets to us, including four or five steps. So I would, you know, increasing it would be probably the best way to save money. Okay. Ms. Warmington, get rid of it. Absolutely not. <laughs> Doubt you're going to find anybody here that says that. But uh, honestly, if, uh, if you believe in checks and balances, this is the ultimate checks and balances. In our state, the governor nominates or, or brings contracts forward. He controls the agenda. Then five people elected by their constituents vote on those things and can veto what the governor brings forward. And it's, it's been a huge, a huge source of ability to hold the executive branch accountable. Um, it is also a huge way to make sure that we, ha we can serve our constituents. If um, someone calls me and has an issue, I can pick up the phone, I can call a commissioner, and I'll get an answer for that constituent. I think that's critically important. Ms. Strathdee? I would absolutely not <laughs> abolish this position. I think it is our job to oversee what the governor does. Um, and it does go back to 1679, if you, if you read, and it was King Charlie II who, you know, wanted us to have, uh, the origin was we were to be um, spies, essentially, for England, <laughs> to know what was going on here, but then, of course, we stood up and said, ah, nope, have a nice day. Uh, <laughs> but um, absolutely, it's, it's crucial that we oversee what goes on. We, we control the amount of power that the governor can exercise. It makes him one of the weakest in the nation. I understand possibly Texas outdoes us for whatever reason. Um, but I'm very proud to be uh, in the live free or die state and know that we have oversight for the constituents. Thank you. Ms. Martin, do you see any harm in getting rid of the council? I think you know, I think you know my answer on that. I think the problem... All I do is ask the question. <laughs> the problem is not that we have the executive council, five people from five different districts, but we can only have one person from each district I'm really enjoying my time with my colleagues here. If I am elected, I would, I would wish there'd be a, a second panel so that they could all be my advisors because they all offer valid dis inf information of different viewpoints that I don't have. And my thought is that I may be blindsided and I, and, and I would say to somebody, and what am I missing here? So my thought is that not only would I not disband it, I would try to have some ways that we could communicate after after the election. Thank you. Senator French. Five of the years serving in the Senate, I thought it was useless and not important. Now that I am running for it, I find it indispensable. <laughs> there we go. Okay. <laughs> All right. Little, a little more serious and thoughtful question here. The, the executive council must vote to accept an appropriate, either some or all of the federal funds that New Hampshire receives. 
In 2021, millions of dollars in federal COVID money were not accepted by the Executive Council. Under what circumstances, if any, would you not accept federal funds? And we're starting with Ms. Strathy on that. If those federal funds come with knots that tie us up in this state and not able to do what's good for this state, then we shouldn't take the federal funds. Let's continue to live free or die. Um, Ms. Martin, excuse me. I agree. I think that uh, it's a simple question, but it's complicated life. Now, the federal government will publicize something that's a good sound bite, but we're the ones who have to face the people and implement whatever's happening here. So my thought is that uh, in answer to the question was tell me more. Tell me more, what are the strings, how will it be used, uh, and what do you say out there? Thank you. Senator French, any circumstances under which you would not accept federal funds? Uh, absolutely, all contracts have two things. They have the price and they have terms and conditions. So for accepting federal funds, you have the price, the money that's coming in, and then the terms and conditions in which you can use that money. And there are probably many terms and conditions set by the federal government to us over how we can use money, and I would reject it if I didn't agree with them. And Mr. Cryens? During my time on the council, um, obviously we started out with COVID-19 and an awful lot of money came in, and I don't know where the state would be if we had not accepted those funds, whether it's the employment, uh, a lot of the money that came in for uh, helping businesses stay alive. Uh, you know, it's heartbreaking when you hear a business owner saying, I just hired six other people last month, and now because of COVID-19, I gotta let them all go. And he's not only losing his business, but as a business owner, I think anyone that's owned a business know when you take on a, an employee, you take on more than just a, a person that works in your business. So as, as far as during my time on the council, I did not see something that we should not accept. Ms. Warmington. Our, we have to remember when we talk about federal funds, the federal funds that have been coming to our state our federal funds that our congressional delegation worked very, very hard to get for our state. And those funds are funds that kept our businesses afloat during COVID, that kept people, got shots in arms for people during COVID, that kept people in their homes, that, that staved off um, evictions. Uh, the federal funds that we received from the federal government during COVID are, were absolutely essential to our state. And just to remember, these are tax dollars that we paid in. Uh, New Hampshire actually takes back less in tax dollars from the federal government than we get, uh, than, than we pay in. And so uh, to, the idea that these funds would be rejected and go to some other state instead of coming here to help the people of New Hampshire was absurd. It actually happened. They rejected the $27 million. And I said, as I said, I kept the heat on them, kept the media on that, kept the focus on that. And the implications of that were that parents were unable to get their children vaccinated before Thanksgiving, before they went away for Thanksgiving. And those kids, a lot of those kids and families came back with COVID. A lot of our elderly were unable to get their booster shots because of that rejection. These were hypothetical, imagined strings that the federal government had attached. They, they, that's why they, they claimed they didn't want to accept the funds. The attorney general told them that that was preposterous, basically, and they continued to reject those funds. We kept the heat on them. They finally had to reverse themselves and do the right thing. They did it again later. They voted down another $7 million. They got, had to reverse themselves on that, too. Um, the, these funds are absolutely essential for our state. Thank you. Um, talking about a contract to upgrade or replace our current AccuView ballot counting machines. That's the topic here. We've had um, a vo special committee on voter confidence, hearing public views, uh, becoming aware of the 
problems with our aging AccuVote machines. So the question is, would you vote for a contract to upgrade or replace those machines uh, particularly a new system that might allow the New Hampshire to adopt ranked choice voting. Oh, I got murmurs from the audience on that one. Um, Ms. Martin? I'll let the ranked choice voting go for another week or month. As far as upgrading technology, again, this is a technology issue, ladies and gentlemen. I have found that the best way to, I love technology. I have a bachelor's and a master's in engineering. I have several patents in myself. I'm a patent attorney. I love technology. I have learned the best way to live is that, to live with the lowest level of technology possible. Every time you add another bell and whistle, that's another potential failure. And you network things together and God knows where the signals are going or who can get inside. So my thought is that, is that it sounds good but beware, there are great dangers to that. And if you can't see inside, if you can't follow the signal train easily, be careful. You may be, may, it may cost you more than, it may, by the time you find out what the problem was, the election, the, the person will have been installed in office. So I think, yes, the, the and, and the second thing is I worked as a, at the poll, Ward 6 in Concord, New Hampshire. And I saw that thing happen. And I saw when occasionally somebody would put it in sideways, or sometimes uh, there, there would be other problems. But relatively, it had a good balance between uh, technology and robustness so that if there was a problem, you could trace the problem and, and, and retrace the voting error. The problem that I see with the higher level technology is that you have so many bells and whistles that you can't find what the problem is and you can't reconstruct what the true vote is. So my thought is if you're going to do that, make sure you buy something no more complicated than what you have and have them explain to you before you sign the dotted line how you, the, the process steps that you can get back to finding what the true vote is. Otherwise, stay with what you got. Thank you. Senator French, AccuVote machines, would you vote to replace them? I don't know, but I certainly would listen to someone as experienced as my opponent to the left when I was coming up with that decision. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Cryens? Well, I think the first time I've heard the term AccuView was right now. So I'm AccuVote. AccuVote. Yes. I'm, I've not heard that term before, so I apologize. It's um, a brand name for the machines. Right. But I, I'm just not familiar with it. I guess that proves why contracts are important and you should read them beforehand because it would be an eye-opening for me. Um, as far as ranked voting, I am not in favor of that right now. I just don't. And the other part of it is I think New Hampshire has proven itself to be very accurate in its voting across the state. Uh, we vote at record numbers, and we also uh, have very few problems in our voting system. So I'd like to see at least what we have stay, and, uh, but I can't accu-vote, tell you. <laughs> Thank you. Ms. Warmington? Um, if the voting machines need to be upgraded to, um, you know, be more because they get old and worn out or whatever, then of course we would take a serious look at that. But I think that the fundamental issue here is in New Hampshire, is that our law requires that we actually have a paper ballot, and that to me is critically important. And so I would love to see if, they, if their technology upgrades are needed, but I would really want to see that we maintain the need for a paper ballot. And when the, what is so important about that is I have personally participated in many, many recounts. And when you go back and do a recount and you find that the variation between the machine count and the recount is minuscule. It is so small. It gives you great confidence. We should all have great great confidence in our voting systems here in New Hampshire. We do it right. We do it with paper ballots. That I would like to see maintained for sure. Thank you. Ms. Strathdy. <clears throat> I agree with maintaining the uh, paper ballots. I agree with being very ca uh, cautious before we move forward with any additional technology. And I think we should have make sure that that there are oversight there there are watchers at all of the polls 
And I would encourage everybody in your towns to spread the word that, that those are important positions. Just come and watch what's going on. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm being very mindful of the time, and I, th I think we could get in one more short question, but I think what I'd rather do is allow you about a minute, a minute and a half for your closing remarks so that if there is something we have not addressed, you could bring that up. And by, um, again, by drawing straws earlier, we decided on that rotation, and Ms. Martin is going to begin with her closing statement. Thank you again for having this forum for us and my chance to meet you all and talk to you. If we value our traditions in New Hampshire, if we value things in the past, trains, our bridges, we have to prepare for the future because it's coming. And I have the skills to deal with part of that. Other people have other skills for that. And I believe that I can give you something that's unique. I know of no other candidate that has a technical background, as I do. I know of no other executive counselor in any of the other four districts that has a science background, let alone somebody that is not afraid of artificial intelligence and data privacy issues. So I, I have a website over there, nhecdistrictnumber2.com. It has a sample ballots showing where to write my name in. I am a write-in candidate, and I would love to serve you. Thank you. Ms. Strathdee? I guess I'll just sum it up by saying, uh, number one, thank you for inviting me here. Um, I think that along this panel, you've got many qualified choices and you have a very difficult um, decision to make. Uh, at the end of the day, whoever you choose to vote for, my message is simple. Please vote. Please vote. We, it's, it's a right. It's an, our obligation. Um, remember the dates. One week from today, September 13th, um, the general is November 8th, I believe and um, choose to use your voice. You're lucky to have it. Thank you. Ms. Warmington. Thank you. My thanks to the League of Women Voters for holding this forum tonight and for all of you for coming out to hear uh, what we all have to say. Uh, when I woke up on election the day after the election, I have to tell you, I, I thought going into the election that I was going to be in a Democratic majority on the Executive Council. Uh, I was not. Um, I was not only in a minority, but I was um, a voice of one. And I thought to myself, how am I going to be effective with just one voice? Because as you've heard, the magic number on the Executive Council is three. And um, the governor already has four votes. Uh, so I thought to myself, well, first of all, do a really competent job, do a really good job of this, and make sure that you read every single contract, which I do. <laughs> and then always, always, always treat everyone with dignity and respect, and be a voice of reason. And that has served me so well on the council, as it did as an attorney, as it has in every facet of my life. But I work very well with my colleagues across the table even though we often disagree. Uh, I have been a powerful voice for women at the executive council table. I have been a powerful voice for public education. And I have really approached the job in a very different way, in a number of different ways. So I'll explain just a few of the things that I've done completely differently. One, <laughs> okay, I'm not going to explain them. I didn't see, I didn't see the yellow. So um, I thank you all, and I would appreciate your support and your vote in the Democratic primary on September 13th. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Cryans. Well, um, I'll start like this. I'm a long-distance runner. I haven't missed a day of running in over 11 and a half years. Um, 
My son posted on Facebook one day that I'd run 111,111 miles from the time I turned 40 to 71. And the reason I mention that is I will bring the same commitment, dedication, and hard work that it takes to be a good executive counselor. This is my full-time job. Uh, maybe you don't get paid like it's a full-time job, but it's my full-time job. And um, I loved every moment. And what separated me from the other four counselors when I was on it, and I don't mean any disparaging issues or remarks towards them, but I put out a calendar each week that showed where I was. Uh, so for instance, if I was here in New London and Janet Kidder saw me as one of your select board members, she might come over and see me or Kim from the, the uh, town office because I wanted to let people know that I was in their communities. And um, during my 19 years as a county commissioner, uh, one of the things that hadn't been highlighted and I thought it might be was climate change. We brought in two items that one item we put in a biomass plant, it reduced our oil consumption from 100,000 gallons down to 9,000 gallons. And on top of that, we put geothermal in our new jail. So many of us are probably gonna make it out of this world all right with, with what's happening, but we have to be looking after our children and grandchildren. So I will ask you for your vote. Um, I've spelled out that I'm a strong advocate for women's rights, but I will ask for your vote. And uh, come September 13th, one week from tonight, we will all be looking at our watch, probably watching WMUR and seeing the results scroll across the bottom. So thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Senator French. And I too would like to thank the league for hosting this and each and every one of you for coming tonight and listening to us. Sitting here listening to everybody, I can guarantee you this, each one of us love the state and each one of us want to serve our constituents in this district. What, what's different might be the philosophy that we're going to bring should we win that seat and therefore the way we're going to vote. So all I can say is after all the handshaking, back slapping, sign waving, speech making, and baby kissing is over, you're gonna be asked to go to the polls and select one of us to represent you. And all I ask is that you think about what you heard tonight and pick the candidate that will most and best represent your philosophies in Concord. Once again, my name's Harold French, and I'd appreciate your vote. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I was negligent in not explaining that there is another candidate on the ballot, on the Democrat ballot, Bradford Todd. He was invited. He did not respond to our invitations. We put his name up there because he will be on the ballot. Um, but we have no further information about him. So at this time, I will lift my ban on applause so that you can join me in thanking these candidates both for running and for their very thoughtful answers tonight. So thank you all. And I thank you all for coming and remind you that a week from tonight, We'll have some results. Uh, there are some WMUR candidate forums going on tomorrow night, Congressional District 2, where we live. The night after that, the uh, GOP candidates for the US Senate. And on Friday night, the GOP candidates for governor. In case you didn't get enough forum tonight, <laughs> tune into WMUR. Thank you for coming. Good night.
Getting out of bed, bathing, getting dressed, cooking and cleaning are some of the everyday tasks that people often need help with as they age. And the Lake Centipede VNA team is here to help. Our homemaker companions, personal care service providers, and licensed nursing assistants are passionate about providing the care and support that keep our clients safe, secure, and as independent as possible in the homes they love. It's very rewarding, but it's also my way of giving back. Um, I've had family members that needed the VNA, and their services were wonderful. And it's just my way of saying thank you. I'm just filled with so much pride and I'm fulfilled to be able to work here, to be able to hang out with residents and patients like Helen, hear their stories, help them when they need help, has fulfilled my life in ways that I could never explain. Anybody who loves their home and believes in their home as much as I do, can't, you can't imagine being any place else. It brings tears to your eyes when you think, you can be in your home. If you are interested in a meaningful career in home care, we are interested in talking to you, even if you have no previous experience. Our entry level positions offer room for growth, and our on the job training, welcoming culture, and supportive team are just a few of the things that make working here so special. Check out our website to learn more or contact us to set up a shadow experience and see for yourself what a career in home care is all about. Well, on Saturday, September 24th, from noon to four, right here at the New London Historical Society, um, we're going to put on our electric vehicle expo, where you can learn not only about electric cars and maybe take a ride in one or two or three of them, but also learn about how to electrify your lifestyle and eliminate oil, propane, and other fossil fuels from your daily diet. I just want to say that this is the third time that we've hosted an electric vehicle expo on this site. Um, we did it in 2016. We had 300 people show up um, and we did it again in 2018. Um, we had 40 electric cars and 400 people came to see them. So we're hoping for a great turnout, um, lots of cars and lots of enthusiastic owners because this is not a car dealer event. Um, nobody's going to try and sell you a car. You got to talk to people who own electric cars, learn about their experience, see the cars, take a ride in them, and then once you've done that part of the expo, you get to learn about electric motorcycles, electric bicycles, maybe even an electric pickup truck because we now have electric pickup trucks here in New London for the very first time ever. And then we'll move on from there to um, all those electric yard tools like uh, lawn mowers, snow blowers, chainsaws, weed whackers, leaf blowers, all those things are now available in electric versions and we'll move on to electric heat for your house which is more efficient than ever and if you want to put some solar panels on your roof or in your backyard and make your own electricity from the sun we'll have solar installers here ready to show you how to do it. People who own electric cars are so enthusiastic about them that they just love to tell you every aspect about what it's like to drive electric, how far you can go on a charge, where all the charging stations are so you never have to worry about running out of battery, and how you can charge your car in your garage at night while you sleep. Um, so in addition to the electric car owners, we'll have the um, solar installers. Uh, and we'll have nonprofit groups here who are telling you about things like um, community power, which is coming to New Hampshire very soon, which will allow you to buy your electricity from a nonprofit organization instead of from um, a profit making electric utility. So um, it's just going to be a, um, a big all electric party, um, both indoors and out, because we'll have a barn full of exhibits. Um, in case the weather is not so great, and a parking lot full of electric cars, um, and um, we'll have electric bicycles. There's also going to be um, free snacks and refreshments. Um, it's free admission to the entire event, and anyone who pre-registers online 
at uvevexpo.org. Anyone who registers online will get a free ticket to our raffle with lots of exciting prizes to give away. Uh, it's se Saturday, September 24th from noon to 4 p.m. here at the New London Historical Society on Little Sunapee Road, Route 114 uh, on the north side of New London Village. Hope to see you here.